So hello, uh, my name is Paul Bristow and um, I've been working for about 20 years in community development. So my background is, is very much in this kind of work and uh, I've been lucky enough that I've been able to work both professionally and as a volunteer in community heritage projects over those over those years. So it's maybe not all that surprising that I'm a bit of a reflective practitioner, so how I'm going to approach today is just kind of with some of the stories of the projects that we've done over that period of time. Um, originally, I was part of a group called Magic Torch, and we sort of decided that, well, maybe give you an idea, we come from a, from, from Greenock, down in Inverclyde, so Sue mentioned earlier, yeah, and um, it's a post-industrial community, you know, it was a shipbuilding town, a sugar town, and so growing up in that area, a lot of the stories you heard, a lot of the stuff that was talked about, a lot of the most recent heritage was post-industrial. And that was good, that was fine, um, you know, we had family working in the yards ourselves, all of the people who were involved in this group, but what it did was it created a very rigid notion of what the past was in that area, as it does in many post-industrial communities. And so we set out deliberately to not look at that. We wanted to look at other stuff. And so we decided to go for the intangible cultural heritage of the area and began to sort of research, um, you know, the folk tales and, and stranger things that are associated with the area that we, we grew up in those stories that had kind of fallen out of the telling and basically we would just turn up at places with a table, put it down and say, Mon, tell us your stories. And, um, you know, since I've been lucky enough to be able to speak to formal folklorists who've been politely horrified by the approach that we took to this, which was just, ah, Mon, we'll write it down, we'll record it and then we'll use it. And essentially that was the, the, the way that we did all of our projects. So some of these here you see, so this was a book that we published, uh, the first book that we published, we were around, we started in 1999, this came out in the year 2000, and essentially it was a, a collection of local folk tales, right? That was all it was, it spanned from about uh, the 15th century up to the, the 20th century. We also decided that it was really important to communicate heritage to non-traditional audiences. That was very, very important. So our future historians, archivists and all of this, well, well, they're kids, right? And heritage, as you heard discussed this morning, is often a tricky word, not very sexy. What do you do in a, in, with your projects that can somehow engage younger audiences? It's really, really important. So we've tried all sorts of different ways of doing that. So, you know, with that book of folk tales, that's nice. It's a nice book. Grown-ups will read it. But we went out and told those stories in schools, you know, we, we became storytellers ourselves to actually communicate and reshare those stories. Um, this, this one up at the top, very briefly, was, was, a, was a nice idea, I thought, a bit mad, where it was just kind of um, billboard heritage, where we just we rented billboard space and we put up enormous billboards of particular unusual bits of heritage associated with that area, so when people were driving past in their car, they would be like, what, what's that? And asked a question which, you know, which would then lead you to a website. And down at the bottom, this uh, fairly recent project where we, uh, we did a Galotians play. Um, Galotians is, you know, a Halloween sort of festival in Greek, and we, we, we were reinvigorating that tradition. I've mainly just shared that photo because I think it's terrifying. <laughs> so, there are, about five years ago though, right, to be more specific, we eventually, we decided that uh, we wanted to try and share those stories with new audiences in a very specific way. Uh, we'd done the storytelling, we'd done all that kind of thing, but we wanted to use something else. We wanted to do visual storytelling specifically, and so we turned to comics. And most of what I'm going to tell you about today is some of the comics projects that we've done. Uh, of course, uh, visual storytelling has a very broad lineage, right? You know, the first ways that we told and shared stories was visually on caves, right? So, you know, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that comics fit very nicely into the tradition of history and heritage. Here's another quite popular comic that people might be familiar with. So it's been there all along, and what we decided to do was, was maybe use that form uh, to, to interest and engage new readers. You'll be familiar, of course, with the fact that lots of other uh, comics are around now which, which do this very thing. This is Frank Miller's 300, that was Mouse there. Um, March, which tells the history of the civil rights movement in America, is a brilliant piece of work. You definitely want to get reading that. There's so many resources out there now which are uh, available to share and, and, and create interest in heritage and all sorts of heritage. So we're really just tapping into a feeling that's already there. So this is our first project, right? Which was essentially to sort of um, part of a project which was sharing the sort of migratory stories of our area, looking at how the community had come together, the Irish, Irish Italian, Highland migrants, all of the people coming through and the stories that we, they'd brought with them, right? And so with the sort of wide-eyed enthusiasm that only people who have absolutely no idea what they're doing can actually get away with, we decided that our first comic was going to be a 64-page full-colour graphic novel um, created with 16 secondary and primary schools. 
uh, and we had eight months. <laughs> and um, we did do it, um, amazingly enough, we did, we did manage to do it. And essentially, we, we set up on a model where we would go to each school and we, they got a vignette, right? They, they had like two pages where we would pick a story from the surrounding area of their school. We would get them to sort of tell us a wee bit about the story and we would get our writers and artists to sort of work together to turn this into a two-page comic strip. And around that was this sort of framework of this guy here, the archivist, who was sort of moving through a museum, picking up objects, and each one of these objects would relate to the stories that were being told. Sometimes we would actually build the objects into the comic strips of this here. You can see some coins from a coin hoard that was found locally. The school nearby knew that story. That's the one that we used for the comic. We were really clear as well. There was no hierarchy of heritage in this, something that, which I quite liked about what Sue was saying earlier, where all of the stories that were captured, whether they happened to be old folk tales or stories that your gran had told you, all good. We wanted them all. They were all just as relevant, all just as interesting. Uh, these here were, were stories about the famous Port Glasgow mermaid. Um, who, who, who we've made famous since then. She's now got an actual bench commemorated to her in Port Glasgow, which I think might be one of my proudest achievements. So uh, that was that was our first project. And if you like, it was quite, um, it was more community heritage focused. You know, there was much more uh, social history involved in all of that. With our second publication, we decided to go back to our more uh, scary uh, folk tale roots. And so we decided to do a sort of 1950s horror comic pastiche, so you'll be familiar with things like, maybe if you're comic fans, Tales of the Crypt and Vault of Horror, all of those comics that were kind of brought over by the Americans in the 50s, subsequently banned because they were, uh, you know, upsetting parents, not children, who loved them. Um, and so we took, again, folk tales and folk stories from our area and turned them into these really short, sort of sting in the tail um, stories. My favourite in this is, uh, is, the, is the Catman. Does anybody know about the Catman of Greenock? Yeah, a few, right, well, those of you who don't, Google him later and prepare to fall into a, a rabbit hole of absolute terror as, as you find out the story of this, this strange kind of urban character who lived, uh, first it starts reported in the, the 1970s, and he exists in one of those liminal spaces that the urban prehistorians love to talk about now, which, uh, which was sort of between the, the east end and the west end of the town. So the west end is the more posh, affluent end. The east end is where you know most of the people who worked in the yards and the industries ended up living, as is generally the case. And um, there was a lane between these two spaces called Scott's Lane. And uh, in there, in a big sort of uh, concrete cylinder, lived the cat man who fed all the stray cats in the town. Now the interesting thing is my granny, she stayed in the east end of the town and uh, we had to walk through one of the, you know, we lived in a new scheme just on the other side of that. So we would walk to Sc through Scott's Lane uh, to go to my grand's every weekend. And I saw the cat man, I know, I know I saw the cat man, right? And I, I'm 1981, 82 we're talking, right? Quite a wee while ago, right? And, uh, and I remember seeing him, I remember him feeding these cats. And, uh, and then 10 years ago, he starts cropping up in stories again. Five years ago, school kids start taking pictures of him and sharing videos of him online. Now, if that's the same old guy sleeping out in, in, uh, in Greenup, which, you know, is not the most sunny of climbs, right? Then he's been around a long time. I don't care whether it's the same guy, though. The story's what's interesting. The fact that 30 years after, two or three generations in some instances, we're still sharing stories about this particular urban bogeyman. And what's particularly cool about him is that the Catman himself, shipyards would have a Catman. A Catman was somebody who would uh, sort of keep a cat in the yards to kill all the rats. That's actually what they were for. And so I think it's really interesting that in the 70s, just as the decline of that industry is happening, that's when this character appears. There's something there about that sort of traditional fairy tale notion of how urbanised spaces are, are influenced by what's going on around about them. So that's the Catman, big fan of him. You definitely go and terrify yourself later. But we used that as a sort of a jumping on point. So we then went to secondary schools this time and said, right, so we've got this scary character. We want to do some stories with you about modern folklore and, and you know things that are more scary to you, and uh, and they created a story using the character of of Slenderman. Do people know Slenderman? Yeah, he's scarier than the Catman, right? So once you've done googling him, right, you go and Google Slenderman. He's a piece of online folklore, digital folklore, effectively created um, collaboratively by a whole group of people. Everybody feeds into this mythos. And again, young people are hugely fascinated by this character. So we had him here, you can just, 
just about seal, right? There he is, the other man. And essentially, it's under as a sort of suited figure with tentacles, no face, who steals children. Right, that's, that's the story, he just steals children, he just uh, turns up silently, takes people away. Very, very scary, but very simple. And so we had a story uh, created by the school about the Slender Man coming to Greenock and going to Tesco's and uh, <laughs> he didn't buy in, he just stole some children, obviously. And uh, essentially that was it. The same landscape, the landscape you're familiar with, your hometown, except juxtaposed with this really scary sort of creature, right? That's the idea. So. That one was, was, we were all set for, for people to be offended by what we had done there, you know, and, and using scary stories. And what we did specifically was that we, because it was a horror comic, we went out to, uh, you know, like there was a horror uh, night-a-thon for Halloween at the cinema. We dished out the books for free at that. We went around youth clubs and did it. We deliberately targeted the audiences that we thought might like those things. And because some of the stories were a wee bit gory, we were, we were sort of waiting for the folklorists, heritage group, nightmare sort of headlines. Didn't happen, we were really disappointed. Um, but we, we, we got to that, uh, we got through that, a model of how we actually work with people to create comics and stories. And uh, our next project was, was much, much different. And again, perhaps quite relevant today, um, given that it's from Emirates State. So this uh, comic, Achibaba, is about essentially a, a local battalion from Guruk in Greenock. In Port Glasgow, who um, local to me, and uh, they went to uh, Achibaba, which is uh, to take Achibaba, which is a hill essentially in part of Turkey during the Gallipoli campaign. And the story was was sort of well, the whole project was funded by HLF. And when we got the funding, we had said we were going to do a comic. And as soon as we got it, we actually ended up a wee bit sort of rabbit in the headlights on it because it was like, well, how do you do something like that in a way? that is respectful to the memories of people that are involved in that process without it being, you know, too, too over glamorized. And that we hit upon the notion of, instead of us telling the story, we went to the primary sources and so we got magazine articles from the time, the letters home, we got poetry from, from the soldiers and all of that sort of thing. And we used those to sort of tell the story of the campaign, sort of weaving it across um, all of now, if you're not familiar with the Gallipoli campaign, it's an incredibly complex piece of sort of geopolitical social history within an already complicated First World War situation. And a lot of the things that happened during that cam campaign impact on exactly some of the stuff that's going on today. It's a, it's a very important piece of history. Um, but so we wanted to make sure that people kind of a wee bit understood that before finding out about our local battalion. Um, and so we, 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 did, we did create a bit of a framework around it, but essentially everything that's in there is the words of the soul. So this one, for example, uh, is a poem. It's actually quite famous. It's called Stand in the Trench Achilles. You might have, you might have seen it. Sometimes, in fact, it's read on Remembrance Days. And um, it was written by Sir Patrick Shaw Stewart, who was a, a relative of the local baronial family in our area. And he went away to fight like everybody else. And he gets injured and he, he's sent to Imbrus, which is uh, a sort of an island where they've established a hospital um, just in the, the, the sort of theatre of war. And while he's there in the hospital, he writes this poem. And the poem essentially is a, about him, if, you know, if you're familiar with the Iliad, essentially the whole Gallipoli campaign was sort of badged as if it was a, a modern Iliad. You know, that was, the, it was deliberately, propaganda was used in that way to kind of make it seem like this huge heroic effort. And so he uses that in this poem and essentially imagines his own death and the moment which you'll also maybe be familiar with in the Iliad where, where um, you know, Achilles he, he cries for his fallen comrade. And so he imagines how heroic his own death might be um, just as he's getting ready to go back to the theatre of war. One of the things that we decided eventually to do with this pro uh, project was not shy away from the, the more uh, horrific imagery of war. And that, that I was, we definitely stand by that decision and it was, a, it was definitely a good way to go because it's made this particular book popular within schools who are quite happy to use it alongside you know, some of the history texts that they're looking at. Um, and it's one of those things that with comics in particular, you can do something quite effective where the, the text doesn't always match up with the images. You can say something in the text which, which is really undercut or contrast with the images that you're seeing. So here we've got sort of letters home about how brilliantly everything's going, and obviously it isn't at all. And um, there was, there was a, a, a downside to that, which was 
that unlike lots of their other projects where we had um, been involved with local events and everything else, when it came to sort of launching this, there was a, a centenary celebration for the Gallipoli campaign locally, and we were sort of we, we, we weren't we weren't able to distribute this publication at it because it, it, I don't know that it, it was never actually stated that it, that it made people uncomfortable or anything like that, but certainly it maybe wasn't quite what people would expect in a remembrance celebration, and we did understand that. Um, however, since then, we've, we've certainly gone in and done a lot of work with schools on it. The, the difficulty, and I suppose this is the point I was trying to make, is that although this was a community heritage project and everything else, and we tried really hard to sort of not impose our voices by using the voices of the people within the campaigns and everything else, well, you know, you can only go so far with that. Essentially, the, the pieces that we chose to use reflected our own sentiments, uh, and so it is obviously, um, intentionally or otherwise, a bit of an anti-war uh, comic. Right at the end of that, what we got to again was this notion that, so we, up until this point, we've been sharing uh, comics with uh, other people. We've been creating those comics. We've been creating those comics as a way of uh, bringing heritage to a wider audience. At this point, we decided that probably it would also be really good to involve other people in creating those comics. And this is where we sort of turned into a, a slightly different focused organisation. Um, and so we, we created that range of workshops and programmes that we would take into schools and start working with pupils. So it would be heritage focused projects, we would help them create a couple of stories, but also everybody in the class would create their own comics. And we've been lucky enough to do loads of those projects over the last year. So this one here was um, about a, a sort of it's a Gaelic project, obviously, that we did with a local primary school. And essentially, it's a, an adaptation of uh, a, a ballad about a shinty match between the Greenock and the Glasgow Gales. It's a real grudge match. Perhaps you're familiar with it, so I don't know. It was a, it was, it was a, it was a heavy, heavy day. The Glasgow Gales come down uh, on New Year's Day to, to face off against the Greenock Gales. And this was commemorated by the poet Mary Waller, who's a, who's a very famous um, balladeer. And so we worked with their Gaelic primary to adapt that poem, but then got them to write their own comics about being on their way to the shinty match and what would happen and whatever else. It was a really nice one. One we did very recently last year, in fact, with Scotland's Urban Past, was that we worked with a, a group of young people to, to sort of look at an old cycle track in their area, which originally had been um, a railway line. And so we imagined the ghost train of that, you know, still travelling along that railway line. And, um, you know, we, we really got the, the group together. So along with uh, the Scotland's Urban Past team, we went out, we got site surveying done, they, they walked past these places that were, you know, now outside the cycle track but would have been alongside the, the original railway line, old factory spaces. It's an old bomb shelter which is now a news agent. And essentially we used those places and spaces within the comic itself so that essentially what you were getting was this notion of looking at somewhere you're really familiar with but in a different way because that's really at the crux of what we've been using comics for. You know, when you walk past a place every day, it kind of fades into the background, you stop noticing it, but these places are no less amazing and magical than some of the places that we read about in other books. And so we were really keen to sort of inject that sense of mystery and magic into the town with all the projects that we do. Um, but this one in particular was, was really good fun. This year, uh, just we're, we're almost at the end of a project, where again we've been working with the team from Scotland's Urban Patch, you see Fiona there, who, who is uh, the one man of mayhem, who's sitting in the back there, I love Fiona, who uh, essentially here what we did was we decided to use uh, a hill fort, Craig Marlach hill fort, um, in our area, in Port Glasgow, as the basis for a series of uh, artistic interpretations, not just comics in this instance, we also did poetry, um, there's some music that's been done and all that kind of thing, a whole range of different things. This launches at the end of this month. I think it's just worth pointing out that something that's really interesting, I think that you said earlier as well, was the, the thing that was the biggest hit, right? The, the biggest hit of this programme was when the team brought in a box full of objects for the kids, right? And those were all used as the jumping off points for their stories and their poems and their music, these objects, the physicality of things. And so it, it really can be understated how important that is, particularly in areas such as our own where, you know, that even though there might be a museum, it doesn't mean that kids are, are visiting it. You know, you, it's, it's, there is still a place for that bringing out, you know, of, of stuff and the physicality of heritage. Um, although there's loads of brilliant technologies, nothing quite beats picking up the stuff. You know, I think that's really nice. Um, in particular, one object for, for this project was like a, was a snake bracelet kind of thing, yeah. Everybody loved that. Everybody really, really loved it. So we've ended up with like half a dozen poems and comics about this snake bracelet coming to life and eating you and things like that. So, so this will be launched uh, later, later this month and you'll be able to see it and read it all online. 
we also did some photos for that project as well. How am I time wise? Had any, any wished? I think if we want to leave space for questions, we've got 10 minutes before lunch. Okay, right. Well, I'll very quickly wrap up then. Essentially, we've used comics in lots of different ways outside <coughs> of those structures as well. So this one was a community campaign where we were campaigning for the community use of an old, the old sugar sheds and we used uh, the popular Tate and Lyle character, Mr Cube, to tell the story of the uh, the sugar industry. Don't be fooled by his wee smiley face, incidentally. He, you know, he was anti nationalisation a total capitalist, Mr Cube. Um, but, but again, a useful character to use in that kind of circumstance. Um, we, we did an exhibition last year where we used the comic covers to communicate really quickly uh, sort of pieces of important uh, Scottish history and heritage. We actually did one on the Claybank uh, Blitz, so, so I'll send you, I'll send you that uh, just, just, for you, just for your interest. And right at the start of this year we did a book called Stowaways which um, you can read online and uh, essentially it's the story of a couple of wee uh, boys who are who stow away on board a ship heading for Canada. Spoiler alert! They don't all make it, um, and it's a very, very sad story, which was hugely controversial at the time. You know, the, the captain of the ship was eventually put on trial. So, in lots of different ways, we've used projects, and I'm happy to talk about any of those with you any other time. But I think I'll wrap up now so that we can have some questions. Okay.